Hi, my name is Ron King, and this is a series of chats about situations in my life and how I've shown up for them, sometimes gracefully, very oftentimes not. The format is uh, a short conversation moderated by a woman named Libby Delena, who I just met, and uh, I don't know her, she doesn't know me, uh, and the chats are unscripted. She has had a number of conversations with some people close to me. She starts every episode with a question, and I don't know what that question is. My response is in real time, her reaction is in real time, uh, and we've recorded the conversation to share with you. When this project started, I wasn't sure what I was doing or why I was doing it, and in fact, I was very nervous about it. Um, in the end, I realized it was incredibly therapeutic and helpful for me to say everything that I've said out loud um, and to acknowledge uh, sort of what I've been through and who I am as a result. Uh, if in turn it is helpful to anybody, then it's worth the time and it's worth sharing. So uh, I hope you enjoy. I appreciate you taking the time to listen. I thank you. I don't know, there's something right now, despite the fact that it's this beautiful sunny day and spring is coming out, there's a, a weight, I don't know, is it in the world? Is it, um, I don't know, maybe it's just personal, but I know you you have um, a profound, I don't want to say sense of resilience, you, you are profoundly resilient. And I will say selfishly, I would like to hear about that. I don't know. Am I feeling a little fragile today? Am I feeling the weight of the world? I don't know. I, I know it would be helpful to me. <laughs> you're you're feeling fragile, so you want to make sure that I get right there with you. So no, uh, I want to hear. No, I know. I'm no, I want to hear the um, the the wisdom of when one feels fragile. What you know, you clearly, you clearly know. Um, some very profound lessons because you've shared with me some of your, you know, fragile moment, your own personal fragile moments. You don't have to retell those. I, I'm looking for wisdom. I'm looking yeah. for what is the so <laughs> the key. So that is very much Ron King this shit, right? So sort of this journey right. between you and I started with the idea that I have bounced back from a lot of different um, lows, and that bounce back in its very nature is Ron King that shit. So I actually fine tuned the uh, the ability to run King that shit with my own personal life, having nothing to do with anybody else. And then and then we figured out how that skill set that I developed, that survival skill set that I've developed, will help me in life and career and coaching and parenting. Um, so you know, it's I grew up the gay son of a Southern Baptist minister missionary. Um, with a mother that had health issues and very young parents. So that wasn't easy. I think most of us didn't have it easy. Um, it, uh, you know, I was incredibly picked on um, and in, a, in abusive situations um, until one day I was at a party and I was drinking some peppermint schnapps. I was probably 15 or 16 years old. And I had a moment where I realized, oh my God, everyone, I hear the laughter. Normally everyone is laughing at me. And in this very moment, because I'm drunk and I'm being silly, everyone is laughing with me. Um, and then I dove into drugs and alcohol nonstop for 12 years. Um, I don't think from that moment I ever stopped drinking. Um, and, you know, in some ways that was survival. You know, I often say that before, uh, drug and alcohol addiction almost killed me. I think it saved my life because I was at a critical point where I needed um, a connection. So, so then I got sober, which I think, you know, we could talk about that in another episode, but, um, you know, there was a woman who I knew um, was sober. I didn't know anything about it. Uh, I had uh, attempted suicide and did not succeed and um, was homeless and sleeping on my drug dealer's floor. Um, 
And I went to her and I said, I need help. And she helped me. Um, and then 25 years later, I've one day at a time, I've never drank or done drugs. So that was one. Um, when I was 29 years old, I was diagnosed with skin cancer. Um, I had melanoma removed from my arm. That was, I was incredibly lucky with that, but that was definitely a, a, a mental and emotional blow, more so than a physical blow. Um, and then in the year 2000, I broke my neck in two places. So I was swimming in the ocean, hit a wave wrong, it pushed me into the sand. Um, you know, uh, uh, emergency transport later, realized I had two breaks in my neck. Um, I had swelling in my spinal cord so bad that I had lost my movement. And my brother was with me and he thought it was the end. And so to this day, my friends talk about the text they got from my brother saying that I've been in a horrible accident and I've lost the ability to move. Um, what we didn't know is that it was just the swelling pressing up against my nerves that when the swelling went down, miraculously, both breaks, both fractures didn't touch a nerve. Um, and so I had a full recovery and uh, I walked again. Um, and so, you know, I've talked to you about this before, where I think that there are people who are born with grace and hum humility, and um, and then there, there are those of us that need to be shaken to our very core to get it. So through the drug addiction and the cancer scare and the broken neck, um, I got the picture. Um, <laughs> uh, and so, you know, what of those- picture? Yeah, what is, what is the picture? I mean, I guess it's sort it's of- that life is fragile, that, um, that I don't need to be an asshole, that um, I'm here for a reason, that there's a greater purpose that I need to figure out to serve, that, um, that this life actually means something. And that, you know, we've talked also before about being the ball inside the pinball machine, bouncing around some sort of chaotic life or be at the controls. And it was through all of that process that I realized I'm in control of this. And, um, and in many ways, I felt like I was fulfilling a um, destiny that uh, was assumed I would have. And so it was, the, you know, I realized I was kind of proving them right when they said I wouldn't amount to much. Um, and so, you know, when I recovered from my broken neck, I started consciously applying the idea of making my life matter to me and to others. Um, and then things were pretty good for a really long time. So, um, you know, I found good work and um, I, 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 let's, I guess I, let's not forget that I flunked out of college because of my drinking and drugs. So um, finding good work was a miracle in itself. Um, but also because of white privilege, uh, I was not asked very many questions. So, uh, Anyway, so I found good work and had a great career and fell in love and had a great love life and um, raised a kid and had a great parental relationship with the kid. Um, and then the relationship ended and the job ended, um, which is fine. So but I will, I, I, let's talk for a moment about um, sex and self-esteem because it kind of falls into all of this. So. When I was in my relationship, I was in a relationship for 13 years, a very loving and committed relationship. And in those 13 years, my sex, my approach and attitude towards sex was in check and good. Like I was in love and I felt attractive. I was in love with somebody who I thought was attractive and vice versa. And we had a very healthy and wonderful sex life. The years before that and the years after that, not so healthy. Um, and Really what I mean by that is just that I am riddled with insecurity. Um, you know, I fell in love when I was 32. So before that, I really honestly had had very little conscious sex. Um, because, you know, I don't know. I didn't know what I was doing. I felt ugly, like whatever reasons, I just didn't. So then I flourished in my relationship and it was great. After that, you know, then my relationship ended. I'm in my late 40s. Um, and I was fat when uh, Eric and I broke up. So I lost a bunch of weight to get my body in shape. Um, but I never really recovered from this idea of like, especially older, I'm not one of those people who are aging gracefully. I don't like it. I don't embrace it. Um, and, you know, I really struggle with thinking that I'm deserving, thinking that I'm attractive, thinking 
that anybody wants uh, me for me. Um, and so, so before Eric and after Eric, I actually had very little sex. So in the years after the breakup, I had very little sex. Um, and when I did, it was pretty clunky and weird. Um, but I was in a situation with a guy that I met on an app and because of my thinking, um, I was thinking how lucky I was. Like he was this young, hot stud. Um, and I'm not deserving, but he was playing the game and I, you know, instead of making it seem like a process, he seemed into, although I knew he wasn't, I just, I, because I felt I wasn't deserving and because I felt that I was the lucky one instead of feeling like he was the lucky one. Um, I, you know, made some bad choices. So, you know, at this point I'm 50 um, and I break out in a rash that I can't make go away. So eventually after enough research, I realized a rash might be an STD. I literally have it, luckily I'm not over my neck, but all over my body. So I go to the clinic, tell them, look, I had some sex with a shady person. Um, and I think I have a STD and they were like, okay. And as they were talking, they did their finger prick and they said, oh, but you're also HIV positive. Um, and I'll never forget it because like, I remember the whole room coming to a pinpoint. I remember staring at the floor and they had a sound muffling machine on the floor and I was just staring at the sound muffling machine. Um, and I said, absolutely, it's impossible. Like I am actually the least sexually active person, you know, um, you know, I have had sex with this one person in the last two years, one person in two years. That's not me. It was just a bad test for it again. So three tests later, um, I was diagnosed HIV positive and, uh, with a horrible case of syphilis, um, at 50 years old. And um, I have told four people this story. Um, but I feel like it's important to share because I'm putting out a series of content that makes it sound like I have all the answers and I know what I'm doing. And I'm on top of my game. And if you'll just live a life like me, you'll have this amazing life, which is not at all where I'm coming from. What I am saying is that I have had it rough and I've made a lot of bad decisions. Um, but luckily I have sort of figured out how to run King that shit and have come through them. Um, and so I'm sharing that experience because if I can help somebody avoid the same pitfalls, then that's great. But I'm not on a soapbox because at the age of 50, after working really hard to live a really good life, I was unemployed. I couldn't afford my apartment anymore. I moved out of my apartment and moved into a friend's house. So I was unemployed, I was homeless, and I was HIV positive. After really living by the books, um, and that was a point of despair, uh, unlike any that I had ever felt. Um, because I didn't understand why this was my life. And because of the um, stigma, mostly on, from myself, but also from the general public, I couldn't talk to anybody. Um, so, uh, as it turns out, in 2019, um, being diagnosed HIV positive is not a death sentence. Um, I literally contracted HIV uh, in June, on June 16th. I know the date because I had sex once in two years. And I was diagnosed on August 4th. So we caught it very quickly. Um, and because of that, I became undetectable within two weeks of treatment. Um, and I remained undetectable for the last a year and a half or two years, however long it's been. Um, and so, you know, I can't give anybody HIV. I, uh, it hasn't, doesn't have the opportunity to recount on my body. And, um, 
you know, it's more dangerous to be diagnosed with diabetes than HIV today. So, um, and when you're undetectable, you are, you can't spread it. So from a straight book perspective, I'm fine. Um, but of course, I haven't had much sex since then, have I? Because if I struggled with thinking I was worthy before, um, having to have that conversation with somebody, it was something I was not equipped and still am not equipped to do. So I say all this on a recording, uh, not knowing if we're going to release it because I haven't told my family. Um, but I thought we should have the conversation. We should make the point that I don't have it all figured out, that I'm only sharing my journey um, in case it's helpful. Um, and also that, you know, insecurities around sex for men or women or gay people or straight people or anybody, um, you know, can lead to bad behavior and that have real consequences. So it is my fault that I have HIV. I don't blame it on anybody else. But, you know, I only wish I would have not felt so desperate for human touch and that I had not felt so insecure that I could have said, no, sir, that's not what we do here. But I felt like I was lucky to be getting some. Um, so that was a bounce back. That was very hard. And there were times, again, this was very recently, this was after a successful career and successful relationship. There were times where I thought to get up and go to the bathroom, I have to move my right leg and then I have to move my left leg and I have to move my right leg. And I was literally doing what I could do one step at a time because I didn't know what else to do. Um, and of course, the friends that I did share with were incredibly supportive. Um, and I was very lucky to have a friend's house that I could live in. And um, and I started rebuilding. I started rebuilding, you know, my emotions and my mental state and my financial state. And, um, and you know, we are doing this project together because I'm at an amazing place in my life. Um, and so I'm really happy. Um, but I wasn't just a very short time ago. Uh, and so when you talk about dark hours and resilience, um, I had hoped that a drug addiction and being homeless and cancer and a broken neck was enough that I had put, paid my dues. Um, but it never stops coming at you. And even for those of you, like I heard somebody make a comment the other day and it wasn't about HIV, but it's about someone doing something stupid. And I heard somebody say, how could you be this age doing something so stupid? And I thought, well, because you just can. Like, um, anyway, I've said all I need to say about that, I think. Um. Should we give a virtual hug? Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Um, hey, thank you for sharing that. Um, I feel it over, all the way over here on the other side of the country. And I think I just have one, maybe one closing note, which is I just listening to you, I would say that to wrong king that shit is resilience, and that ultimately resilience is about love, self love. That resilience is, as you said, you um, have a, a powerful list of things that uh, you have navigated. And each time your, honestly, your love for yourself, that self uh, is what brought you through it. Even, even in the midst of misfortune and I mean what's the likelihood of being caught in a wave and having that happen or I mean sir, uh, and, and the, so but I would, the interesting I, thing that we have talked about is that it's both right both. it is the absolute lack of self-love that got me in that situation um yeah so you can have both like that is to me the that's right using an interesting thing about life that is so important to grasp is that 
you can have both. I think you can have both, but I would argue that the resilience that helps you navigate, any of us navigate those ways out of what feels dark is in fact the beginnings, the beginnings of belief in ourselves, the beginnings right. of loving ourselves again, even when we have had that moment where we didn't and we forgot that and we put that down. We put down right. that that right. affection for ourselves. That's right. And it's not and binary. It's not one or the other. Right. It's not that we don't Yeah. It's also sheer determination. It's like, not that we don't love or do love. Right. Yes. I, yes. I yes. I am going to live a life that's worthwhile and meaningful. Um, yes. And we, we've we talked in another podcast that, you know, my parents told me when I was very young that life was boring. And I said, that wasn't going to be my story. <laughs> and I have succeeded at that. But um, I am determined to live a life that I don't regret living. And that determination is what the bounce back really is, I think. Um, oh, but I need to get myself together. So maybe we should just wrap okay. this one up. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>